1920, in Arden's Scholasticism appeared the second book written by Jacques Maritain. His first was one on Henri Bergson, whose thought had saved Jacques and his wife, Arisa, from an, what I regard as a rather arrogant suicide pact. If there was no way out of materialism, life was not worth living. Over against the prevailing materialist mechanism, Bergson introduced an insight to the evolving world, an elan vital, which generated mechanisms and terminated in human beings in their relationship to the mystical. His 1907 creative evolution ended with the claim, the universe is a machine for the production of the divine. Access to the elan for humans involves a dynamic creative intuition. This would play a central role in Maritain's later work on aesthetics. Raisa's spiritual director, Father Humbert Clarissac, a Dominican, introduced her to the work of Thomas Aquinas, and the two became ardent Thomists. Hence, the second book, Art and Scholasticism, is basically on Aquinas. Outside of his commentary on Dionysius's divine names, where he presents the pseudo Areopagite's views of divine beauty, Aquinas has only a few things to say about art and beauty, and that in a set of scattered quasi-aphorisms, mostly borrowed from Aristotle. Maritain said that one could gather them together and develop a full and complete theory of art. His work, he says, is only the beginning. He proceeds, as the editor of the English edition said, to read between the lines, period. In 1952, that between turned out to be 423-page work, Creative Intuition and Art and Poetry, which Etienne Gilson is rumored to have said, and I thought he was a Thomist. <laughs> Maritain begins art and scholasticism citing Aquinas that the beautiful is id quod, quod visum placet, that which simultaneously is an object of seeing and of delight, as an object, however, of intelligence open to the infinity of being. It's important to stress the latter. As Aquinas has it, being is what first arises in the mind and makes the mind to be a mind. It directs us to, to everything, both the wholeness of the realm of principles and the wholeness beyond surface of individuals. It is articulated in the transcendental properties of unity, truth, goodness, otherness, thinghood, and beauty. Analogously realized, Maritain said, beauty belongs to the intelligible and descends for us to that beauty which is co-natural to us, namely beauty found in sensible things. Following Aristotle's techne, Aquinas defines art as recta ratio factibilium, correct reason for what is made. Maritain stresses ratio, reason, the intellectual character of artistic insight. It has a parallel in Aristotle's phronesis, prudence, as recta ratio agibilium, correct reason for doing. Again, Aristotle, Aquinas follows Aristotle in his initial distinction between sense and intellect. Sense presents the individual, intellect apprehends the universal. However, in his Nicomachean ethics, while discussing intellectual virtue, Aristotle says that nous, or intellect, apprehends both the ultimate principles and the ultimate particulars. I would add that's because we work from the notion of being, which includes both individual and universal. In Art and Prudence, we're dealing with unique individuals, artworks and persons and situations. Here, intellect, we might say, configurates the individual, artworks and, and persons. It grasps that which fits which coheres with the whole situation or the peculiar piece. In fact, this occurs always through what's called recursion to phantasms, that is to develop sensory experience, which configurate the immediately given sensory situation. Both techne and phronesis, art and prudence, are habituated modes of apprehension, ways we possess ourselves for making and doing. Yeah. Maritain makes the surprising claim that art is even more intellectual than prudence. He doesn't explain that further, but it's intriguing. Art produces works characterized as beautiful. The basic characteristics of beauty, according to Aquinas, are integritas, proportio, claritas. Integrity means that everything is there which ought to be there. Aristotle makes a similar observation when he says that a good work of art is like an organism. Everything is there which ought to be there, and nothing that is there is superfluous to the overall functioning. Proportion means two things. The integral parts are in proper proportion to one another, but also that the object is proportional to the observer. As to the latter, Aristotle noted that the term beauty cannot be applied to that which is too small and that which is too large to be taken in by the human observer. Aquinas notes that things can be proportional to the observer because the observer, observer is proportionate in itself. 
he says the sense is a kind of ratio. Aquinas at one place identifies claritas as brightness of color, which is an astonishingly reductive statement, I think. Maritain focuses on the link between sensory form and intelligible light, an insight rooted in Plato, made explicit by Plotinus. Aquinas deals with that in his Dionysian commentaries. In the 1240s, Aquinas attended Albertus Magnus' lectures on Dionysius' divine names. Stemming from that context, in De Pulcro at Bono, on the beautiful and the good, an opusculum formerly attributed to Aquinas, Albert laid stress on terms that describe the surplus of beauty over goodness as, and these are the terms he employs, a light, a shining, a radiance, a splendor, an incandescence, a resplendence, a lighting, fulgor, superfulgence, a claritas, linked to claros, which means famous, parallel to the Greek doxa as glory, a supersplendence, rooted in the substantial form. This, in an otherwise typically austere scholastic presentation, this piling up and even manufacture of terms to describe a single property is indeed remarkable. Albert is clearly struggling to give expression to a surplus in the experience of beauty beyond the analyzable sensorily present properties to which it might otherwise be reduced. In the expression splendor forme, this luminescence is linked to proportion and consonance, which are understood as a relation of aspects within the form of the object. This is the source of Aquinas' list of the properties of beauty. But wherever, whatever the identifiable ratio is involved, splendor is a surplus property. And in the Dionysian context, it is understood as the directly perceived expression of the depth of divine mystery irradiating all things. Maritain interprets it this way. He says, to define beauty by brilliance of form is to define it by brilliance of mystery. And he says further that it is, in fact, the light of being. He applies that to the work of art. Now, several times he refers to the eternal rules of art in the concluding, in the Creative Intuition in Art and Poetry, he mentions the golden ratio as, uh, as found, for example, in the Nautilus shells as one of the rules that govern uh, art, art itself. Such rules would be objects of rec the recta ratio Aquinas identifies as an intellectual virtue which has hold of the principles governing a given region. But whatever the eternal rules might be, artists develop breakthroughs of form that generate new rules. The highest of them for Maritain can only be found in the, individual, in the individual artist in developing his work. A strange conception, but speaking of rules here underscores a kind of necessity in the uniqueness of the finest work or a given artist's style. He says that the great artist will work not against the rules, but outside and beyond them. This involves Kant's notion of genius, the one through whom nature gives the rule to art. However, Maritain underscores that this is the work of intelligence and not of the irrational. Now, art is imitation. What is imitation? Not yet distinguishing fine and useful art, Aristotle said that through art, in place of teeth, horns, and claws, men produce knives, spears, and axes. Art here partly imitates, partly completes nature. Imitation here concerns not copying something, but re reproducing a function. Going on to what we would call fine art, Aristotle said that music is more imitative than painting, because while the latter gives only signs of disposition or, or ethos, Music evokes the imitation in the aroused ethos. And in tragedy, art imitates action. So function, ethos, and action, these are the forms of imitation for Aristotle. The division of fine and useful art began to show up, Maritain claims, in Leonardo's contrast between the painter and the sculptor. The sculptor is an artisan, dirty, sweaty, generating the noise of hammer and chisel, while a painter could be well-dressed, even accompanied in the background by music. Leonardo also spoke of exact replication as the task of painting. He reported favorably about a dog wagging its tail when viewing an image of its master, birds attempting to light on a railing in a painting, a monkey frolicking before the image of the monkey, etc. But Maritain notes, Leonardo's practice fortunately belied his theory. Learning rules for producing exact replications of natural things was the aim of the French Academy, initiated by Jean-Baptiste Colbert under Louis XIV. Maritain referred to the academicism it promoted as a barbarous system of artistic education. Barbarous in spite of the technical sophistication it involved. At any rate, it was against academicism that Cezanne led the revolt. Now, 
Maritain claimed that the great artist never represented nature in its immediate appearance. Leonardo's theory and Zeuxis' practice to the contrary notwithstanding. There was a famous encounter between two ancient Greek painters, Zeuxis and Parasios. The latter bragged they had painted grapes so realistically that birds pecked at them. Zeuxis told him to pull back the curtain to see a real painting. Parasios reached for it only to find out the drapes were painted. Zeuxis said that fooling men was greater than fooling birds. Hegel remarked that the invention of hammer and nails was more important for humankind than the production of illusion. Nature already does a fine job of producing things. Art has a higher mission. Maritain has a rather long discussion of how artists treat nature. The careful study of nature is supplemented by also studying how master artists, master artists, in studying master artists who painted natural things to get a sense of how they rework nature. He says, artistic creation does not copy God's work, but continues it. This follows Aquinas, who said that art imitates nature in her mode of production. Art imitates nature in her mode of production. Hegel followed that direction in exalting fine art over nature, saying, God is even more operative in history than he is in nature. Great art involves this inspired transformation of surface to say something of the underlying and ultimate. In his discussion of Christian art, Maritain claims that, again, quote here, although from other points of view it's diametrically opposed to Christianity, contemporary art is far closer to Christian art than academic art. This will be one of the focal points of creative intuition in art and poetry, to which we now turn. In his early work, Maritain identified himself as being anti-modern. However, in his later work on creative intuition, he claimed that modern painting and poetry advanced beyond the tradition and deepened the apprehension of subjectivity to become more intellectual than traditional art and prudence. That provoked a book entitled Jacques Maritain, Anti-Modern or Ultra-Modern. Ultra, ultra and as he noted, Etienne Gilson remarked when he read it, as we noted, and I thought he was a Thomist. <laughs> Maritain, in fact, here developed some of Aquinas' central insights. Aquinas speaks of the agent intellect, which grounds the apprehension of the universal. Maritain translates this as the illuminating intellect and extends its operation to the apprehension of the distinctive individual in art and prudence. Aquinas also speaks of co-naturality in the ethical and mystical orders, being of one nature with a given virtue or in some sense with God. Maritain extends that to the sphere of, the fine, of fine arts. Again, he extends Aquinas' notion of intellectus, which is contrasted with ratio. Intellectus is the beginning and end of reasoning as direct insight. Intellect is contemplative, the repose of the mind in relation to the movement of reasoning. Maritain develops the notion of intellectus in the direction of special kinds of intuition. But he also carries out extensions of the usual understanding of poetry and music. He extends poetry from the art of words to the creative intuition which generates all art and indeed extends it to all creative activity in whatever region of human experience there is. Further, he extends music from harmonically patterned sound generated by instruments to what he calls inner intuitive pulsions based on an inner dynamic attunement generating expression in all the fine arts. Here he seems very far from Aquinas' thought. He locates the origin of these extensions in what he calls the spiritual unconscious, which he claims the scholastic knew but did not develop the corresponding theory for it. The spiritual unconscious is the source of creative intuition. He speaks of this unconscious as the single root of the soul's powers, which he also calls the center of the human person, the totality of the self, and the heart. Root, center, heart, totality seem to indicate or circle around the same reality. As von Hildebrand, so Maritain speaks of the heart as the origin of the work of art. The work of art, says Maritain, issues from the heart of the artist. Again, he says, there's a kind of musical a musical stir produced in the depths of the living springs in which creative intuitions are born, audible only to the heart. In terms of essential grounding for Aquinas, intellect is the single root. Imagination flows from intellect and sense from imagination. To intellect and sense correspond will and appetite. But this only distinguishes and relates to faculties. Maritain is concerned with their operative togetherness. In this work, the single root is developed experience which lies in the spiritual unconscious. But there's also a residue of experience in what he calls the automatic unconscious explored by depth psychology. The conjunction of these two areas is the matrix of art. I'm quoting here. It is the totality of man, sense, imagination, intellect, love, desire, 
instinct, blood, and spirit together. And the first obligation imposed on the poet is to consent to be brought back to that hidden place near the center of the soul where this totality exists in the state of creative source, unquote. That indeed is the heart. But as Heidegger also noted, the rational knowledge of our culture has developed a method has developed a mathematical knowing detached from wisdom, which, Maritain says, has estranged the human mind from itself and led to a withering up of the heart. At times we meet only what he calls the empty contrivances of a merely constructive or critical reason estranged from the heart. A special kind of intellectual intuition is involved not only in the arts as creative intuition, but also in the work of great mathematicians and in the great philosophers. He mentions Heraclitus and Plato, Aristotle and Thomas Aquinas, Plotinus, Spinoza, and Hegel. Here again, he parallels Bergson, who claimed that every great thinker operates out of a single generative intuition. But he even finds a kind of poetic intuition in, and I'm quoting here, big business, revolution, religion, sanctity, or imposture. When the mind of man attains a certain depth or mastery in the power of discovering new horizons and taking great risks. Imposture is certainly a strange insertion, but as in acting, it involves being able to grasp and reproduce a whole style of existence. Such intuition always involves co-naturality, being immersed in, in an area of operation until one has a certain feel for its possibilities, what Michael Polanyi called personal knowledge. Maritain has made much of what he calls the intuition of being, without which one may be a great scholar or a dialectician but can it advance with facility into metaphysics? In his preface to metaphysics, he speaks of the intuition of being in terms virtually identical with what he used to describe creative intuition. The intuition of being is, and I'm quoting again, a sight whose content and implication no words of human speech can exhaust or adequately express, and in which, in a moment of decisive emotion, as it were a spiritual conflagration, the soul is in contact, a living, penetrating, and illuminating contact with a reality which it touches and which takes hold of it." Close quotes. One interesting thing here is the conjunction of seeing and, emotion, seeing and emotion, being informed and transformed, for emotion here means touching and being touched. Now because this is an intuition of being, though it may be occasioned by encountering a single individual, it opens up to the whole. It, in fact, the so-called light of the agent intellect is precisely the function of the notion of being, which is all-encompassing. Maritain implies that insight into being to poetic intuition. Again, I'm quoting, precisely because it has no conceptualized object, it, poetic intuition, tends and extends to the infinite. It tends towards all reality, the infinite reality, which in, is engaged in any singular existing thing, close quotes. And again he says, quoting, the poet is confronted with the very object of intelligence, that is the ocean of being in its absolute universality. He experiences the radiance of the ontologic mystery as the third and deepest aspect of Aquinas' conception of splendor forme. Maritain's focus is on poetic intuition as involved in the arts. And here poetic refers to its original Greek meaning, namely making. Poetic intuition is what he calls an intellectual flash aimed at making a work of art. It is, quoting again, that intercommunication between the inner being of things and the inner being of the human self, which Plato called musike. It has its source in the preconceptual life of the intellect where it functions in a non-rational, non-logical, but not anti-rational way, of which he says music in the narrower sense may be the most significant instance. Reason is operative in the depths, but here, Quoting again, reason does not only consist of its conscious logical tools and manifestations, nor does the will consist only of its deliberate conscious de determinations. Far beneath the sunlit surface are the sources of knowledge and creativity, of love and supra sensuous desires, hidden in the primordial translucid night of the intimate vitality of the soul. Close quotes. Here the, in the, it, here the inner music which inspires creativity in all the arts has its origin. Music, as instrumentally produced, he says, has the peculiar privilege of expressing, beyond any possible meaning of words, the most deeply subjective, singular, and effective stirs of creative subjectivity, too deep-seated to be possibly expressed by any other art. That was a quote. But since his focus here is upon the inner music, a full treatment of music in itself would require another analysis beyond the scope of the present work. So Maritain restricts his treatment to art and poetry. 
the former here being restricted to painting, that is art as painting, and the latter extended from the narrower to the larger sense of the poetic. In poetry proper, there are two musics, inner intuitive pulsions and the music of words operating together with the imagery referred to in the words. Poetry signifies first through concepts subjected to the primacy of logical connection, a definite set of things standing as objects of thought, and second, as the final aim, a mysterious flash of reality, which has, grasped, has been grasped without concept and which no concept can express. That again was a quote. It involves what he calls a magnetic supraconceptual power, expressed in the supraconceptual power expressed in the music of the words. Again, Maritain underscores his claim that poetic intuition itself is an intellective flash and not an irrational impulse. In classical works, there's a tendency to prevent the inner music being conveyed by the words because of the claims of rational expression and conceptual unfolding. He says, quoting again, without modern poetry, we could not have become full, I'm sorry, without modern poetry, we, yeah, we could not have become fully aware of the importance of this inaudible, wordless, and soundless music. As we pointed out earlier, it is a music only the heart can hear. This has its parallel in painting. Good modern painting, he says, awakens in us a deeper emotion and resonance and delight and love than many masterpieces of the past. The old masters, in their respect for natural appearances, faced an obstacle to the inner, deeper sense revealed after the breakthrough in Cezanne. As Matisse noted, the camera has freed painting to be painting. Classically, art is said to aim at beauty, but in some of the modern forms of poetry, beauty is repudiated in forms of arcane knowledge. Maritain claims that beauty is not the end of fine art, but what he calls the end beyond the end. Diotima in Plato's Symposium said that the sight of the beautiful engenders art. Maritain says that beauty is the atmosphere surrounding the generation of the work, but not the end, which is the embodied form. I presume he means that beauty, like joy, follows the work of art, and like joy, it cannot be found when it's sought. When beauty is made the end, Maritain says, some form of academicism is the result. He cites Edgar Allan Poe, art is a wild effort to reach the beauty above. The work can at best reflect this beauty above. Apparently, academicism is fixed upon a self-contained sensory beauty that does not radiate the spiritual. Beauty itself is among the transcendentals, as he said earlier. Beyond Aquinas and following Bonaventure, he claims that beauty is the radiance of the transcendentals united. Sensory beauty, infused with the spiritual in nature and art, is a subject of trans is a subset of transcendental beauty. Now, as before, art involves imitation. But rather than art imitating nature, Maritain cites Oscar Wilde, who said, nature imitates art. He goes on to say that only after Giotto did we become aware of the beauty of mountains. The Romans spoke of the teditas alpium, the boringness of the, of, of the Alps, of that which made the march to conquer Gaul more difficult. The message apparently did not stick. In the 18th century, Winkelmann, on his way to examine the sculptures in the Vatican Museum, while passing through the Alps, pulled down the shades of his carriage so he did not have to look at all that ugliness. The Alps, right? Marjorie Hope Nicholson claimed it was the Romantic poets who taught us to consider the mountains beautiful. I found this astonishing since mountains, mountain scenery along with sunrise and sunset are the typical instances of natural beauty that people refer to when he asked what's beautiful in nature. This shockingly points to a kind of historicity in the awareness of beauty. Whatever you want to make out of that one. Artistic imitation opens to the inner reality of things. Maritain notes that Chinese painting, by its treatment, was able to bring out from things their encaged soul. Such painters were already beyond the copying of surface. The illuminating intellect reveals the inwards of things, in Aquinas' terms, their essay, their to be, beyond everyday surface adjustments and scientific apprehension. At the same time, as providing the light of being, the illuminating intellect opens up a sense of the whole of what is in and through the individual work. And as with all great painting, there's simultaneous manifestation of the creative self and the thing. But where the Chinese were focused on the things depicted, non, I'm sorry, but where the Chinese were focused on the thing depicted, modern Western painters are focused on the creative self whose depths they were the first to discover. But, Maritain notes, even when painters move from transformation of ordinary surface to the rejection of it in ab abstract painting, they still drew upon their experience of, quote here again, laws of dynamic equilibrium, laws of proportional correspondences, optical laws, psychophysical laws grounded on nature. 
abstract painting involves some vital element, a rhythm, a contrast, a contour which had been seen in nature. Both Henry Moore and John Dewey made the same observation. For Dewey, abstract art may be more truly imitative of nature in its rhythms and energies than academic art which replicates surface. The French Academy was far from that. As we said, it taught rules for exact copying in painting and sculpture. Maritain returns again to Cezanne's revolt against academicism. As the liberating figure in contemporary art, he revealed the buried significance of visible things, the very interiority of things manifest together with the inner life of the artist. Paired with the work of the Academy, recta ratio factibilium does involve principles, even rules, but Maritain insists here, as he did in his first book, they must be perpetually newborn rules. Modern poetry obeys more exacting laws and rules, for, they're free from, for they are free from contingent rules, each work, word being in tune with the music stirred by poetic intuition. For the academy, the rule was a recipe. It has its proper application in computer-generated tile and wallpaper patterns, which do not point beyond themselves. However, new forms tend to fall into the routines and become a new academicism. Praising the art which broke with it, Maritain warns against a new academicism and calls for painters now to free contemporary painting from the academicism of the non-representational system. Genuine painting, he claims, especially after modern liberation, attains to a kind of metaphysical vastness and degree of intellectuality which resemble those peculiar to poetry. He observes that this advance into creative subjectivity far beyond the this advances into creative. Sorry, he observes that this advance into creative subjectivity. Sorry, once more. He observes that this advances into creative subjectivity far beyond the medieval universe within which Aquinas dwelt. For all the soaring truth it embodied, the medieval, medieval universe was, and this is a quote again, was lacking in a great many truths that the modern man has discovered but at the price of his internal unity. The chief of these new, newly discovered truths is creative subjectivity. This is a quote again. The great essential fact of modern culture is the spiritual advent of creative subjectivity, distinct from the self-centered ego which came front and center in Rousseau. In the arts, the latter involved a brute or merely subjective emotion. The result is emotionalism and a shallow intellectualism falling back on the empty contrivances of a merely constructive or critical reason estranged from the heart to which we referred earlier. The great breakthrough of modern culture involves, as he constantly repeats, an obscure grasping by the artist of his own self and of things in a knowledge through union or through connaturality which is born in the spiritual unconscious. Here, intellect is far beyond concept and logic, exercises itself in vital connection with imagination and emotion. Maritain claims that as Cezanne in painting, in poetry what occurred after Baudelaire was of much greater historical significance than the revolutions in physics and astronomy, which were great indeed. And that's because it affected the spiritual life of the people of the West. So for all its problems, modernity advanced in the deepening awareness of creative subjectivity and into a deeper awareness of the innerness of things. To conclude then, for Maritain, fine art has its origin at the center of the soul, at the root of the soul's powers, in the totality of the self, in the heart, from which arises musical, musical pulsions in a creative poetic intuition which generates the work of art. This thoroughly modern conception nonetheless has its roots in Aquinas' concepts of agent intellect, connaturality, intellectual intuition, and the ground of the soul in intellect. For Maritain, illuminating intellect works at the center of the soul, which has become connatural with things to be, things to be expressed, based upon the flash of intellectual intuition aimed at production through musical poetic attunement. My basic claim is that in creative intuition in art and poetry, Maritain has performed an Aufhebung, or a synthesis, uh, rising above the contrast, of, of Aquinas and modern achievements in poetry and painting. He gives a sterling example of how to increase and perfect the old by the new. Thank you.